feel like God's going to release something in this place. I'm not exactly sure who came in here feeling restricted and confined, but I feel the Spirit of God saying that I'm going to release everything that I placed on the inside of you so that you can step into the next dimension of who you are. I hear God saying that there's something in this earth that only you can do, but you've been restricted and it's time for release, 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 release. I'm going to move you past your excuses. I'm going to move you past your shame. I'm going to move you past your trauma. I feel the spirit of release in this place. And God has given me an assignment, and it's always such an incredible honor to be used to be a part of what God wants to do in your life. I won't be before you long. I'm going to be in Mark 3. I'm so grateful for our bishop. Can we take a minute and just thank God for the chief of this house, the the vessel, I think he's on that uh, <clears throat> midnight train to Georgia, because there's work to do in Atlanta. Ladies, make some noise in this place. If your life has been blessed by a woman, you make some noise in this place. Woman, thou art loose, the final chapter, the final chapter of this historic movement is going to take its final bow in Atlanta. And I encourage you, I know Pastor Ture already mentioned it, but if you are not going to be a part of it virtually, it is maybe too late for you to make it to Atlanta. It may be too late for you to actually be in the room, but I hear God saying, I'll bring the room to you. You want to make sure that you are plugged in to this virtual experience. Some of y'all going to get more breakthrough at home than us in the room because you have to worry about your wig sliding off. You have to worry about, you're going to be loose from your spanks because you're not going to be there, but I want to encourage you to use this opportunity to plug into the virtual experience as an opportunity to disciple other women, to bring other women who you know have been going through and say, girl, just come over, have it playing in the background and let God do all of the rest. And so I want to make sure that you avail yourself to this tool because I just have a feeling that God's going to lose more woman, women in one year than he's been doing throughout the entire trajectory of woman thou art loosed. I hear God saying there's a multiplication that's going to take place uh, connected to this experience and you want to be a part of it. So proud to be a part of a church that does it for real. I'm so proud to be a part of a church that does it for real. Woman Thou Are Loose is not just a cute little conference. The Potter's House is not pretending to put people back together. I'm here to tell you that marriages have been restored, that families have been reunited, that businesses have been erected, that generational curses have been broken because when you came into this place, the potter put his hand on you and you became a masterpiece you never thought you would be. Mark 3, verse 1. Jesus is doing what only he can do. He's in the throes of his ministry. And his effectiveness is evident because he's got both supporters and critics. It's how we know his ministry is effective. He doesn't just have fans, he has critics, he has people scrutinizing, he has people judging, he has people waiting for him to slip up. He's got an audience. And when we find him in Mark 3, the audience is there. They want to see what Jesus will do with a certain man, the Pharisees. And my text begins and it says, and he entered the synagogue again. And a man was there who had a withered hand. So they, they being the Pharisees, watched him closely. They wanted to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. Will he break a rule to heal this man? Will he get out of order to heal this man? So that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Then he said to them, the Pharisees, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, 
Being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, bump them, stretch out your hand. Got to get that Ebonics version of the Bible going because my Jesus give it to him real, straight, no chaser. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> and he stretched it out and his hand was restored as whole as the other. My subject is unlock your heart. Spirit of the living God, you see our hearts, you know our heads, you know our destiny. And God, you know exactly what it's going to take for us to break the generational curse. You know exactly what it's going to take for us to raise the child. You know exactly what it's going to take for us to bring the fullness of who we are into this present moment. God, my prayer is that in this room you would unlock every facet of what you knew when you formed us in our mother's womb. God, I pray that fire would return. That passion would be restored and that you would send us from this place stronger, more focused, more vibrant than when we came in. God, and as for me, no nerves, no fear, no insecurity or inadequacy. This is your moment. This is your time. This is your word. So I pray for grace. I pray for wisdom, prophecy, and that the fullness of the Holy Spirit would be available, that you may get the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. You guys can be seated. There was a young boxer in the 80s named Mike Tyson. He went by Iron Mike. And he swept this genre of boxing in the 80s because he fought differently than anyone else did. As a matter of fact, he became known as the baddest man on the planet. Because his fighting wasn't just about technique, it wasn't just about skill, it wasn't just about finesse, though he had all of those things. What set him apart was the way he fought with his heart. He fought with his heart in a way that no one had ever seen before. He fought with his heart in a way that set him apart. He had an intuition because he was fighting with his heart. He could anticipate the next move because he was fighting with his heart. There's something powerful about having your heart in it. You can have the skill, you can have the technique, but if you don't have the heart for it, you're going to be just a little bit behind because someone with heart is anticipating what's coming next. Somebody with heart brings their whole focus to it. It is not uncommon in sports, in cooking, in relationships, that people begin to back away when they feel like their heart is no longer in it. Something about recognizing that your heart's no longer in it. My dad used to do all of this cooking. He talked about it all the time, he'd cooking chicken dinners to help with the church and smell like fried chicken and then going to his job. He stopped cooking a little while ago. <laughs> Only time I can get him to cook is if I like really put pigtails in my hair and go back to looking like a little girl because I, I don't want him to just cook. I want him to cook with his heart in it. You know what I mean? Don't just slap me nothing together. I want you to cook with your heart. And if some of y'all, I'm going to be honest with you, you still making Thanksgiving dinner and your family wants you to stop because your heart is not in it no more. The potato salad don't potato no more. The ratios, you're not seasoning. You're putting too much seasoning because your heart is not in it anymore. You still know how to do it. You still have the technique, but your heart just isn't in it anymore. Somebody's going to make this a clip and send it to somebody. Let it move you. November's right around the corner. Let us step in and help you. What I envy about athletes and perhaps even artists and musicians is that they have the opportunity very often to recognize whether or not their heart is still in it. Because there's often a demand on their heart to show up in the moment. I envy this because unlike athletes or musicians who get to do this frequently, 
Most of us don't know when our heart is no longer in it. Because we have a routine. Because we're just doing it the way that we did do it when our heart was in it. We got a rhythm and I'm doing the same thing as when my heart was in it and I just don't realize that my heart isn't in it anymore. No, I'm not as fulfilled. No, I'm not as focused, but I'm still doing. Don't allow the fact that you're still producing results to make you feel that you're still producing change. You can produce results, but we haven't been called to just produce results. Anyone can produce results. I'm here to bring transformation. I'm here to make make a difference. I'm not here to keep status quo. If I'm keeping status quo, I've done something wrong. When I do it from my head, I maintain status quo. When I do it from my heart, I have new vision. I have new innovation. I have new creativity. I've been making him all kinds of stuff to eat because I do it from my heart. Baby, did you know I could go French for you? Did you know I could make Italian for you? I'm doing it from my heart. I want you to see something. There's something powerful about being in relationship with someone who's bringing their heart into it. You've been at the job where that new person comes in and they're all excited about what they want to do in the company because they have heart connected to it. Maybe we've been praying that God would give us something in our head, but what we really need to be asking is God bring me back to a place where I'm doing it with my heart, where I'm married from the heart, where I'm raising these children from the heart, where I'm preaching from the heart. I don't want to have an autopilot because I don't serve an autopilot type of God. I serve the kind of God that demands I do it with all of my heart, with all of my soul, and with all of my mind. So if my head has overpowered my heart, I've lost something. My head, my head overpowers my heart. Is that just me. I have a heart to start it. I have a heart to write it. I have a heart to step into it. But the moment it's time for me to actually do it, my head gets in the way. Very few of us recognize the moment when we lost heart. A teenage boy falls in love, experiences his first heartbreak. His head kicks in and says, never trust another woman again. His head overpowers his heart. A woman starts a business and she starts it with passion and she starts it with vision and focus, but the bank tells her no and no one buys any sales and now all of a sudden what started with the heart has been sabotaged by the head. I loved you when I first met you, but now that I know you, No, no, I know. I believe God brought you into my life. I do, but now I just, God didn't tell me. Child, I'm raising a teenager. I be trying to tell my head, like, oof, don't do it. You know what I mean? Because I'm trying to keep my heart in it. But I see why certain parents talk crazy to their children because they head. Sometimes your kids are talking and you want to be one of those parents. I'm talking to y'all over here for a second therapy here for a minute. Sometimes you want to be like connected to them and I want to create space for them to express their self. That's from the heart. But my head, when I'm tired, starts saying you don't have any bills. You don't have to do anything but get up in the morning. But my head can cause a wound to their heart that they leave my house looking for someone else to repair so I have to remind my head can't always trust my head. Oh, I feel God on this. I can't always trust my head. You see, a little while ago, I accepted Jesus into my heart. And the only issue with most of us accepting Jesus in our heart is that we still live in our head. And if we accept Jesus in our heart, we got to return to living from the heart so that our heart can tell our mind what we doing. Our heart can tell our head what we thinking. Our heart can tell our head, I forgave them. My heart can tell my head, I'm moving on. 
on. My heart can tell my head no weapon formed against us will prosper. My heart can tell my head you are qualified. My heart can tell my head you are anointed. My heart can tell my head that all things are going to work together for the good of those who are who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. My heart has something to tell my head. So if I'm living from my head and I'm missing my heart, I'm missing all of who I am supposed to be in the moment. I hear God telling somebody, you can't think your way through this one. You're going to have to go back to your heart. You can't think your way through this marriage. You're going to have to do it from the heart. You're not going to think your way into this business. You're going to have to do it from the heart. Take all the courses you want to. Do all the studying you can get that's good for your head. But God says, I want your heart. I want to know what's happening down on the inside of you. I want you to sit in that brokenness for a minute. I want you to tell me what they did to you. I want to know what's happening in your heart because I'm not just going to sit there and mishandle your heart the way other people did. When you give me your heart, I am the potter and I know how to put it back together. When you give me your heart, if you would delight yourself in the Lord, I'll give you the desires of your heart. My head told me I wanted success, but my heart told me I needed wholeness. My head said, perform your way out of this, but my heart said, stand still and see the salvation of God. <laughs> Gotta get got to put my heart into it. I'm not the best to ever do it. I am not the most eloquent. I have not gone to multiple seminaries, but one thing you're going to get from me is I'm going to put my heart into this word. I'm going to put my heart into this message. I'm going to put my heart into raising these children. I may not get it right and I may have to apologize, but I'm going to put my heart into it because when I stand before the Lord, I want to be able to say, I did everything I could with the heart she gave me. And sometimes it was broken, and sometimes it was weary, but it was always at your service. And sometimes it got ugly, and sometimes it wanted to shut down, but it was always to your service. I had to go back and get it from the trauma. I had to go back and get it from the pain, but... Where did your heart go? Where did your heart go? Was it somewhere in the last check? Where did your heart go? Where did your passion go for that love? Where did your passion go for that ministry? Where'd your heart go? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where's your heart for worship? Where is your heart for service? Where is your heart for breaking that generational curse? It wasn't just a good idea. It was a mandate that began in your heart. And I hear God saying, this one's going to happen from the heart. You're going to have to sit in that heart. You're going to have to Allow the heart to make the difference. There's a scripture that suggests to us that we cannot trust the heart because the heart is deceitful. See, I got somebody, somebody's like, she te mm -mm. trust your heart if you want to, go somewhere. <laughs> but the scripture doesn't just end with saying the heart is deceitful. We use that as an excuse to abandon our heart. It says the heart is deceitful above all things. But God says even though the heart is deceitful, there is something that you can do that would allow you to be positioned to trust your heart again. It says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. You abandoned what God wanted to fix. So you don't live from the heart anymore because your heart deceived you. But God said, if you would give me your heart, I'll help you to never get tricked again. I'll help you to never let them get over you again. I'll help you to trust yourself again. I'll help you to forgive yourself again because you abandoned your heart doesn't mean that God abandoned your heart. God just says, if you give it to me, I'll show you what's in it. If you give it to me, I'll show you what you've been ignoring. If you give it to me, I, the Lord... I'll search it. 
I'll tell you where your weakness is. I'll tell you how that trauma is showing up in your de decisions. I'll show you whether or not that dream is a dream that was birthed because you were afraid versus what I placed on the inside of you. Let me search your heart. That's what David said when he got in trouble and he couldn't trust himself anymore. He says, I can't trust me, but I still got to be me. So can you show me me so that I understand what I'm working with so I can create boundaries so I can recognize what's you and what's me and I can draw a line in the sand search search my heart God can tell when you're living from your head and not from your heart God can tell when you're showing up in this autopilot, when you're doing what you think you're supposed to do for the sake of the children, when you're doing what you think you're supposed to do because you got saved, God can tell. I can tell you this I know for sure. In Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve are in the garden, Jesus says, God says, who told you you were naked? It's funny, Adam, Adam came out, he came out the way God made him. He had no issue with that. But then something happened to his heart that made him move to his head. And now he is conscious and insecure about something he never thought of before. God, I wish I could say this the right way. There are experiences that can make us so self-conscious that we lose focus on where we're supposed to be conscious. And when we bring that version of ourselves into the presence of the Lord, God wants to understand what moved you from where I placed you, who told you you were naked, when did you start thinking about the way that I created you instead of doing what I told you to do? When did you start second guessing how I formed you instead of trusting that I made you exactly the way you needed to be formed in order to carry out what I called you to do? He gave Adam very specific instructions. He said, be fruitful and multiply. He didn't say go put on no clothes. He didn't say hide yourself when I come around, but something shifted in his heart and when it shifted in his heart, it shifted his destiny. That's why you got to get back to your heart because if you don't get back to your heart, you're going to miss God. If you don't get back to your heart, you're going to miss destiny. You're going to be focused about the wrong things. You're going to be majoring in the minor things. You're going to be making it about you when it was never about you. You know why Adam didn't have have to worry about the fact that he did not have on any clothes because he was not called to protect himself. He was called to project himself. If you will project yourself and be fruitful and multiply, I will protect you. I'll make sure that your skin is thick enough for the thing I've called you to do. You want to protect you and God wants to project you and that's why you cannot move. But if you will say, I trust you. Though he slay me, yet shall I trust in him. I'm going to keep on projecting I'm going to keep on producing. I'm going to be fruitful in every season, and I'm not going to track down every rumor. I'm not going to track down every lie. I don't have time for that because that would shift my focus. And I don't know about you, but I'm in a season in my life where I got to be focused. I'm in a season in my life where I got to make every second count. Y'all must have time to waste. I don't. I have a projection that I got to make sure is in the earth. How else am I going to break? a generational curse unless I start projecting something different. How else am I going to show that there's another way to do it unless I start projecting there's another way to do it? I can't protect myself and project myself at the same time. So if I have to choose, I just want everyone talking about me to know I'm going to keep on projecting. So you might as well get some water and clear your throat because you're still going to have something to talk about. You're still going to have something to walk. Watch because I'm projection. This is my projection season. This is my season for me to take what's in me and put it out of me. I'm projecting from the heart. Gotta project. 
I gotta show my children something different. I gotta project. I gotta project what's in my heart. I am grateful that you're in my life. I gotta project that my mind will keep me from allowing my mouth to open up and really affirm you and who you are in my life. So I gotta project something different. I can't be in relationship and protect myself from harm at the same time. If I'm gonna be in it, I'm gonna be all the way in it. And yes, you may hurt me, but that's between you and God. But it won't be because I left some of myself on reserve. I'm gonna give you all of me, baby, because all of me is all I got. And your acceptance won't determine whether or not my all is enough. I got to give all of me because I got to answer to God. I got to give all of me because I don't want to hold anything back. I got to give all of me because I want my children to see it's possible. I want to give all of me because when I get to heaven, I want to be able to say I gave it my all. I did it from the heart. I did it with the next generation in mind. I did it thinking about how you could be glorified in my life. You cannot be glorified with half of who I am. You cannot be glorified with the parts that I want you to use. It's going to take all of you to get God's glory. It's going to take all of you for you to become to move in these rooms, to release that gift. It's going to take all that you got, baby. And that may intimidate some of you because you don't think your all is enough. But remember, he created Adam just as he was. And he said, you in this garden naked can still be fruitful and multiply. You in this garden naked can still have dominion. You in this garden can still be everything you were created with everything you need. So if you divide this and allow your head to overpower your heart, you're going to miss God. You're going to miss him. And you're going to be envious watching somebody else who's not as talented, who doesn't have as much experience, who doesn't even understand the industry the way that you do. But they got heart, baby. <laughs> Bless your heart. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. And not in that Texas way where we say, Bless your heart. Bless your heart. In a way that you can allow yourself to live in that heart again. I want to be clear that this is not an indictment or me throwing any condemnation your way for choosing to live in your head over your heart because I understand it. I understand what it's like to have a heart so broken that you don't want to deal with it at all a dislocated heart. The reason why I feel like it is important for us to begin incorporating all of who we are, especially for this stage of kingdom building that we are in, in this last day moment that we are in, is because we have to realize that the world is dealing with a broken heart. Everyone on the earth, believer or not, is dealing with some level of a broken heart. And there are few things more dangerous than having a broken heart because a broken heart leads to an open head. I used to watch this show called Intervention. It's about people who have the disease of addiction. And when they talk about the moment they first decided to try a drug, it was usually right off of the heels of some type of broken heart. We often judge people for what they do, but we never really consider how it happened. People in this room right now nursing addiction, not because they're proud of it, not because they just wanted to have a good time, but because their heart was so broken that it led to an open mind. Generally, affairs don't just happen. There's something that happens within the marriage that breaks the marriage and then the mind is open. It takes something very powerful inside of us for us to have a broken heart but not allow our head to become open. That means I can have a broken heart, but that doesn't 
doesn't have to change the way I see God. I can have a broken heart, but you cannot have my head because if you have my head, you have my hand. If you have my head, you have my hands. You can determine what my actions are going to be when you get into my head. So I have to receive the type of spiritual maturity that would allow a broken heart to not change my actions. I was reading in scripture about Eve. Eve is my homegirl, but that's for another time and another place. But Eve eats from the fruit, eats from the tree, and we all know this. But I was reading in Genesis 3 when she begins to explain herself about how she was even in the headspace that would make her go against what God said is that this serpent planted an idea about God that broke her, head, that broke her heart. Genesis 3, 2 through 4. His words paint a picture of God that breaks Eve's heart. He says, did God really say that you can't eat from the fruit? And then he goes on to say, ultimately, that that's not really why he said it. He wasn't trying to protect you. He was trying to restrict you. He was trying to hurt you. You can't trust God anymore. There are people in this room who've had their heart broken by God. Yeah, we don't talk about that in church very often. Because it feels like we may get kicked out. Now y'all know. But if we're honest, there have been moments where God didn't do exactly what we thought he would do. And it broke my heart that you didn't save that child. It broke my heart that you allowed it. And now I've got a broken heart and an open mind. And I'm questioning everything that I thought I knew about you and faith and my spirituality. Because I have this broken heart and an open head. I was looking at this moment when Eve receives a different picture and it makes sense to me now that the choices we make when we have a broken heart and an open head affect our destiny for generations. But even with an open head, it doesn't change what God said. I'm gonna close. I got a broken heart and an open head and I've made some decisions that I can't reverse. But we serve a God who will get down in the middle of even the messes that we have created. We serve a God, oh God, I hear God saying, I'm not a man that I shall lie. And I'm sorry that you received something about me. You received a report about me that was different than my heart. But we serve a God who is intentional. And we serve a God who doesn't mind proving himself. So if you have a broken heart and an open head, and you've made some decisions that you cannot reverse, I want you to understand that God is not not finished proving to you that you received a lie not the truth and even though you've got yourself in a mess as a result of it I know how to walk into the bar and pull you out of it I know how to reverse the curse I know how to still get you to the destiny even though your head took you on a detour I want to talk to somebody who feels too far gone I want to talk to somebody who feels like they're stuck and I want to let you know that God has the GPS coordinates for exactly where you are and he is is as close as the mention of his name, you better be careful calling on the name Jesus, 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 because if you are stuck and you start saying Jesus, 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 you think on star is something, but if you think that calling on the name of Jesus is just something we do because it's Sunday, I call on the name of Jesus when I'm lost. I call on the name of Jesus when I'm stuck. I call on the name of Jesus because I want to get back to where I was. I want to get back to what you had in mind. God steps down in that garden and he says you may have made a mistake but the mistake won't make you because I still got a vision for who you are. I still got power backing you up. If you throw your heart back in it, I'll put my power behind it. If you put your heart back in it, I'll put grace behind it. If you put your heart back in it, I'll show you how to get yourself out of this mess. I'll show you how to produce anyway. If you would just 
You better watch out who you're sitting next to. Somebody's about to start swinging again. Somebody's about to start doing it with their heart again. Somebody's going to start prophesying again. Somebody's going to start teaching again. Somebody's going to start reaching again. I ran out of headspace. Now I got nothing but heart. I got nothing but heart for this fight. I gave you the heart for it. I gave you the vision for it. Stop passing it over to somebody else. Stop expecting someone else to get it done. They don't have the heart for it. You irritated watching them, but I'm irritated looking at you because I gave you the heart. Close your mouth and put your heart to work. Close your mouth and put your heart to the test. I'm going to do it from the heart because that's the only way it's going to get done. I'm going to do it afraid, but I'm going to do it from the heart. I'm going to do it nervous, but I'm going to do it from the heart. I may not be eloquent, but it's going to be from the heart. It may not have all of the finesse, but I'm going to do it from the heart. You came to hear Bishop, I get that, but she got me and I'm going to do it from the heart. That means that if I do it from the heart, there is no one who was more anointed to step in this moment except for me because God connected my heart with this moment. God put your heart with that child. God put your heart in that marriage. No one else can do it but you. So write it from the heart. Produce it from the heart. Lead them from the heart. You don't have the skill, so you might as well let that go. Do it from heart. You got the heart for this. And what's from the heart reaches the heart. What's from the heart reaches the heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him. When God got ready to establish a new covenant with the earth, he put his heart into it. Only begotten son. They'll know how serious I am about them because I'm going to put my heart into it. They'll understand how desperate I am to be in connection with them again because I'm going to put my heart into it. My heart is the only thing that's going to get their attention. My heart is the only thing that is going to release the grace that will allow them to be in covenant with me again. God puts his heart into it because heart makes all the difference. So Jesus, the heart of the Father is with him. He is on the earth. And in order for him to get the hearts of others, he starts performing miracles. You know why he starts performing miracles? Because miracles bypass the head and go straight for the heart. I got to perform a miracle, one miracle on one person will attract a multitude of belief from many people. And if I'm going to get people to get out of their head, I'm going to allow them to experience a miracle or witness a miracle. You see, you don't have to experience a miracle for a miracle to change your life. Other people dissect the miracle. I wonder how in the world that happened for them. But me, I receive a miracle because if I witness God blessing you, if I witness God doing a miracle in your life, it changes the way my belief is set up. It gets me out of my head. God, if I saw I saw what you did for her, and I saw what you did for him. Maybe I need to get out of my head and receive it in my heart. How many miracles has God allowed you to see? Don't let them slip through your hands. The miracle is supposed to be planted in your heart. I, 
got miracle seeds in my heart, not because I experienced them, but because I witnessed them. And now I know how to pray with authority because I know who's backing me up. So when I say no weapon formed against me will prosper and every tongue that rises up against me, he will condemn. I am not talking about something I just read. I'm talking about something I've seen. I've seen a tongue rise up against me. I've seen a tongue rise up against you and I've seen God condemn it. I've seen you keep on living anyway. I've seen you keep on pushing anyway. I receive your miracle. You in a row with a miracle and you could look at them lifting their hands and you can look at them acting crazy or you can say that same grace that's on their life. God, let it overflow in my life. Let me get me out of my head. I think I may lose the child, but if God saved their child, then maybe just you looking at a miracle. Wait a minute, Potter's house. Do you think that this little teenage mom was supposed to be sitting up here preaching to you but I want you to understand that you serve a God of miracles and you can look at what God did for Bishop or you can start celebrating about what God can do in your life I'm not just looking at miracles I'm receiving miracles I'm celebrating with you because I'm receiving on my behalf I know how to celebrate your miracle because it helps me to see that a miracle is in my neighborhood how could you take nothing and turn it into something unless there was a miracle somewhere You just need to see a miracle where well, you're looking at one. You just need to see a miracle where well, you're sitting beside one. You just need to see a miracle where well, you're standing in one. Some preacher from the hills of West Virginia has no business sitting with kings, but you connected to miracle. You connected to a miracle anointing, a chain breaking anointing, and the same grace on this house. God, you don't have to do it. Just let me see it. God, you don't have to change it. Just let me see it. Because if I can see it, I can believe it. And if I believe it, I won't think myself out of it. God, just let me see what you can do with broken pieces. Just let me see what you can do with leftovers. Just let me see what you can do with the child. Just let me see what you can do with the broken marriage. Just let me see what you can do when you lose your mind. Just let me see what you can do with suicidal thoughts. Just let me see what you can do with depression. Do you know that guns have been jammed? Do you know that doctor's reports have been wrong? I want you to know that I'm not talking about something I heard. I know it for myself that somebody swallowed all the pills and woke up the next morning and someone needs to recognize that suicide is not the final say. Don't let your head convince you that your heart cannot be healed. think my way out of it. God, what am I going to do? I can't think my way out of it. God, what am I going to say? I can't think my way out of it. God, I don't know. I don't have the business strategy. What am I going to do? This head, this head is not working. This head won't do the math. This head, this head, this head. Living in my head. Doubting in my head, worried in my head, in my head, in my head, in my head. God, help me 
to get out of my head. God, help me to get out of my head. God, help me. I can't predict the future, so help me to get out of my head. Worrying is not helping me, so help me to get out of my head. God, I've been worshiping worry more than I've been worshiping you. God, I got to get back to the heart of worship. I got to get back to what really matters. I got to position myself in a way that I can give you my heart and you can give it back to me and then I can run. I can't run until you give me heart. I can't run until you give me vision and I can't get any of those things in my head. I got to get it in my heart. God, what's your heart for this child? What's your heart for my spouse? What's your heart for this business? What's What's your heart for this ministry? What's your heart for it? God, God, I want to know your heart. I want to search. I want to search your heart for my heart. God, I don't believe that you would just leave me this shattered, so I got to search your heart for what's happening in my heart. Unlock, unlock your heart. Unlock your heart in my, in my text. Jesus and the Pharisees are in the synagogue. They're in the place they are supposed to be. But they don't have the same heart for the moment. Proximity is not necessarily a reflection of being on the same page. The synagogue and the Pharisees, they're all in the same place, but their heart is not in the same place. We all in church, but not everybody's heart is in the same place. Shh, don't tell nobody. Somebody came to look for their husband. Somebody came to criticize. Somebody came to spectate. That's why the scripture says where two are gathered in his name. It's not just about gathering. It's gathering with the same heart posture. They're gathered in the synagogue, but they don't have the same heart. Jesus wants to just fulfill his mission of creating this new covenant. And the Pharisees want to see whether or not he will break the law. They watching him. He's looking for an opportunity for a miracle. If I had it in me to preach three hours, I would take a detour here and talk about the man with the withered hand who was caught in the crossfire of Jesus trying to prove a point. Some people got a miracle because they reached for it, like the woman with the issue of blood. Some people got a miracle because they called for it, like blind Bartimaeus. But some of us got a miracle because we were just caught in the crossfire of Jesus trying to prove a point that I'll break a rule to give you a miracle, that I'll do something that doesn't make any sense. The man was fine living with a withered hand, but for some reason, Jesus had a point to prove. I am the point that Jesus wanted to prove. I didn't ask for anything he did. I didn't call for it. I didn't know to pray for it, but he was trying to prove a point through my life. Some of us, I got caught in the crossfire of Jesus trying to prove he could use anybody. I got caught in the crossfire of Jesus trying to prove it doesn't matter what your past has been. All that matters is that I still got destiny. I got caught in the crossfire of Jesus trying to prove that grief doesn't have to be the end. I got caught in the crossfire of Jesus trying to prove that you can rebuild after destruction. I got caught in the crossfire. You're right, it wasn't supposed to be me. You're right, I have no business being here, but some kind of way I got caught in in the crossfire I was just in the right place at the right time and Jesus said I got caught she got caught in the crossfire
That's the message for another time. This man is caught in the crossfire of Jesus trying to prove a point to the Pharisees. They were just watching to see what he would do. And Jesus turns to them and he asks them a question that they cannot answer unless they consult with their heart. Jesus gets angry in this text, not because of what they said. They didn't give the wrong answer. They didn't give an answer at all. The key to unlocking your heart, it's not about saying the right things. It's in saying something. You know why we lock our hearts down? Because if I allow it out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If I really open this heart, you may hear my disagreements, you may hear my disappointments, so I stay silent. We like to talk about the Pharisees like it's a them, but the truth is it's an us. Because we choose to stay silent instead of opening our heart, instead of allowing it to be released, we stay restricted and confined. Jesus gets upset at their silence, which helped me to understand that the only way that they could stay in their position, the only way that they could stay in their head is if they allowed themselves to not consult their heart. That means that had they opened their mouth, if they had begun to have dialogue, that Jesus, the anointing, the power, the grace that was on Jesus could have enlightened them in such a way that they abandoned the law and recognized that he was there to fulfill it and they too could begin living from their heart again. But they were too afraid too restricted to open their mouth. I want to talk to someone in this room who has been playing the quiet game. Afraid that if I open my mouth, if I'm honest about where I am, if I'm honest about what I think, that maybe it'll be dishonoring or maybe I'll lose all control if I open my mouth and finally let it out, then maybe, just maybe, everyone will see that I'm not holding it together the way that I am supposed to, but I hear God saying, I need you to fall apart. I need your rules to fall apart. I need your regimen to fall apart. This is gonna sound crazy, but I even need that marriage to fall apart because the marriage that it was is not the marriage that it could be because you were too busy trying to hold it all together when marriage is supposed to be the place where you let it all out. I need you to go to war with that child so that you can see the trauma that's underneath there, so that you can see the acting out is abandonment, so that you can see the molestation. I need you to allow them to have room for them to express themselves so that we can get to the heart of the matter. The Pharisees couldn't open their mouth. So Jesus just performed the miracle anyway. But we don't have to be like the Pharisees. We can open our mouth even if it may not be what God, what we think, what we think, what we think God wants to hear. I know for many of us culturally, we don't say nothing because if I say it, it may be what you don't want to hear. It may be too much. I don't know how to finesse it. I don't know how to dress it up. But the secret place is the one place where you can come naked. It's where you can come raw. 
It's where you don't have to worry about hurting anybody's feelings because God is not this emotional being that is going to be offended by your truth. God says, if you would finally admit it, I could heal it because I've been knowing that you were feeling that way all along. He asked Adam, where were you? Who told you you were naked? Not because he needed to be brought up to speed, but because there's something powerful about confession. If you confess it with your mouth. I am reminded of a woman named Hannah. First Samuel 1. And her heart was full of grief. And she could not produce. And the pain of not being able to produce was haunting her and taunting her. And just like in this moment with the Pharisees, we receive insight into what it takes for us to be in relationship with God in such a way that we receive space and capacity and room to live outside of our head. She begins to pray from her heart, from the grief that was in her. I almost called this message, pour your heart out. I believe, family, that one of the greatest gifts, and we know this, one of the greatest gifts that we get, God, is not our gifts, it's not our talents. It's our heart. And I don't know if you're like me and you've been sensing that God is calling us into a destiny moment that is bigger and greater and requires more demand and more knowledge and more skill than any of us can really gather in order to step into the moment. And if you're like me, you've been trying to think your way into it. But as I was studying for this message, I heard God say so clearly, just do it from your heart. But I felt like God needed to know what was in my heart. If I do it from my heart, but I'm bitter, I do it from my heart, but I'm afraid. And God says, I can clear that out if you'll pour it out. If you'll pour your heart out in my presence. If you will dare to open your mouth and let me in. If you'll dare to make space for who I am and what I can do in your life. It won't happen unless you pour your heart out. And if you pour your heart out, I will refill it. I refill it with peace. I refill it with joy. I refill it with creativity. This is why. When we remove ourselves from living in our head and dare to live in our heart, we can't even have shame any longer. Shame is a mind game. It's penalizing you for something that you did. But God is more interested in why you did it than what you did. So God says, if you could get out of your mind and get into your head, I could make sure it doesn't happen again. Shame is not insurance that it won't happen again. Shame is just insurance that you will stay low. But when you give God your heart, God says, I can heal your heart in such a way that you recognize why you ended up in it in the first place. Family, I feel like the only way that we can re really begin this next week, the only way that we can really be positioned to move with prophecy, to open our mouth and declare a thing and establish it in the earth, it's not going to be from what we remember. It's going to be from how we align our heart. If you're in this room and you've been dealing with what I would call a dislocated heart, somewhere along the way you just, you got faint hearted. Somewhere along the way, you got discouraged, you got disappointed, and now you've been showing up, but you're not doing it from the heart. I want to tell you how to get back to doing it from the heart. I want to position you to help you to get back to living and breathing and creating and innovating and establishing from the heart. It's connected to your mouth. The heart and the mouth have connection. And if you would begin to open your mouth, then you would be able to find your heart. What does that look like? 
looks like crying out, crying out to God and saying to the Lord, Lord, I want my heart back. God, I need to receive all of who I am to show up in this marriage, to show up in this family, to show up in this ministry, to show up in this business. I need all of who I am. You don't realize it because you think you're still walking straight, but the truth is you're walking with a limp because you're depending on your mind when you're supposed to walk with your heart and mind. Your heart and mind. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, it doesn't even say that Hannah was praying audibly. It just said she was moving her lips. As you make your way to this altar, as you come to a space where you acknowledge that you've reached the limit on thinking, I don't know what to think anymore. I think I'm just going to have to be. I'm going to have to do it from the heart. You're going to see lips just moving. Somebody may cry out. Someone else is praying from their heart. But there is a desperation when you want your heart back. When you want to unlock your heart so you can feel again. When you want to unlock your heart from the grief, from the despair. I need to unlock, unlock this heart. God can't unlock it for you. Only you can unlock your heart by opening your mouth. Lord, I'm sorry. I've been gone too long. God, I'm Sorry, I lost focus. I don't even know why I do this anymore. God, where is my heart? Am I still playing a game that you're calling me out of? God, my heart isn't in it anymore. I want to understand where it is. And I don't want to just keep showing up and performing in this routine and with this regimen. If you're moving my heart to somewhere else, I don't know who you are in this space. But you've been in this same industry for a very long time. And your heart is no longer in it. And you think that there's something wrong. So you're trying to push your way through it. And I hear God say, saying, no, I'm moving your heart to something different, and you're not going to have lost anything from the time that you had. I'm going to incorporate that into your next. I hear God saying that you got to open up your heart. You got to open up your heart to the possibilities that I'm not done yet. You got to open up your heart to the possibilities that I have not wasted anything. You want it to end here, but I hear God saying, I'm just beginning. After all, isn't that what the Pharisees got in trouble for? They thought that what happened with the law was the end. They didn't realize it was just the beginning. We open our heart by not being married to the way we think things have to be. God, I like it, I love it. But if you're calling me to something else, God, help me to move my heart in that direction. God, if I'm supposed to stay here, help me to discover the passion in being in this position. This is something we pray from our heart. We don't reason it with our head. For just 10 seconds, I'd like to offer someone the opportunity to have a Hannah moment, to dare to begin to use their mouth to unlock their heart. It can be as simple as, I don't know what to say. But I felt something in this moment. I feel like you're still calling me. 
feel like maybe you could still use me. I feel like I could still break this generational curse. I feel like maybe, just maybe, I am the man for the job. I just don't have the heart for it. God, give me the heart to be the husband. God, give me the heart to be the leader. God, give me the heart to step into this position of authority. God, give me the heart to not shrink any longer, but to allow my big heart to step into this big moment. You've had a big heart for a long time. People have commented for years about how big-hearted you are, and now you're standing in an opportunity that is as big as the heart that God has given you. Don't you dare shrink. Don't you dare back down. I hear God saying, release all of your heart into this moment. It's more than enough. It's time for you to finally step into the reality of what I've always known about you. I had you playing in the small league so that you could exercise your skills and your talents, but now I've got a gift and an opportunity that is the size of the heart that I've been giving you. I hear God saying, don't talk yourself out of it. Don't think yourself out of it. Be yourself into it. Be yourself through it. Be yourself in every stage and every dimension of it. Be you in the boardroom. Be you in the interview. Be you at the office. Be you at the bank. Don't think about it. Just be you. Just give them your heart. Just tell them your passion. Just tell them why no one else is more qualified than you. It's not because of what's on the resume. If you only look at the resume, you'll miss the best part of being in business with me. The best part of being in partnership with me is the heart that I bring. I couldn't tell my husband all that he was going to get when he got me, but I told him I'd change your life because I know about this heart that you get when you get me. I recognize the heart that I have for this. And so we want to be open. Because when we do it with an open heart, demons tremble. Hell gets nervous. Because your heart holds the power. If you're in this room, and you want to receive Jesus in your heart. And you're saying to yourself, I want to experience that transformation. I want someone to sit with me and sort through the pieces. I want that salvation. I want to invite you to join us at the altar as well. There is nothing that has happened in my life that has been more powerful than finally not just saying the prayer, but actually committing my life to the life of Jesus. I want my life to look like your life. I want my heart to look like your heart, God. Thank you for Jesus. I want to pray with you. I want to pray for those of you who are making a commitment to start living from the heart again. I want to make a commitment for those of you who have decided that I'm not going to be so consumed with protecting my heart, myself, my reputation, that I cease to project all that you've placed inside of me. Spirit of the living God, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you that you chase down one heart, that you'd leave the 99 just to wrap your arms around one heart. God, I thank you, thank you, thank you that you put your heart into the world, that you knew that if you put your heart into it, that you would teach me how to put my heart into it too. God, I thank you for every household, every heart, every dream, every gift that is at this altar. And God, I thank you that you want to do a heart work on the inside of them. God, I thank you that you want to give them a heart transplant as only you can do. God, I thank you that those childhood memories that broke their heart didn't destroy their heart. God, I thank you that you still want to see 
see them be put back together. God, I thank you that you still want to see them experience deliverance. God, I thank you that the generational curse is going to be broken because it's going to be broken from the heart. God, I thank you that they're going to establish a new covenant and the new covenant is going to happen from the heart. God, I thank you that they're going to release authority, that they're going to release power because they're going to release it from their heart. So God, they are at this altar with a heart offering to you because they recognize that if they give their heart to you, that you will give them the desires of their heart. God, I want to praise you in advance for new desires coming their way. God, I want to praise you in advance for new vision coming their way. God, I praise you in advance that you're going to give them the desire to serve. You're going to give them the desire to speak. And where they once felt afraid, they're going to feel desire. God, I thank you that you are equipping them with heart. You are equipping them with power. God, I thank you that you are in their heart. And because you are in their heart, there is not a devil in hell. There is not a demon known to man. There is not a generational curse that cannot be broken, that cannot be destroyed. God, I thank you that they're going to throw their heart at it. God, I thank you that they're going to walk with courage because they're walking with the fullness of their heart. God, I thank you. That their days of shrinking are over. Somebody's heart is coming back to life. Where you were once faint-hearted, I hear God saying that you're walking out of here with a transplant. Where you were about to give up. Where hell was about to throw a party and rejoice. That somebody's getting their heart back. Somebody's getting their courage back. I hear God saying that service is going to be over, but the fight will just be beginning. And if you thought Mike Tyson was something, you better see See how you come out of this thing swinging. I don't know about your heartbreak, but I know about the God that will put your heart back together. And I tell you that he's going to give you endurance. He's going to give you strategy. He's going to give you innovation. And he's going to get it from your heart. A mentor can't do it. A man can't do it. But Jehovah Jireh is my provider. And he's going to give me everything I need in my heart where it cannot be stolen. In my heart where it cannot be uprooted in my heart where I can allow it to touch my children in my heart I thank God for atmospheres being changed because I release my heart I thank God for industries being changed because I release my heart God I thank you for my family coming to know who you are because I release my heart my heart I got my heart back I got my heart back. I'm reaching for my heart again. I'm reaching for my heart. I got a heart for this marriage. I got a heart for this city. I got a heart for this community. I got a heart to see it done well. I got a heart to see it change. I got a heart to see it transformed. If you still got heart, you still got power. If you still got heart, you still got access to vision. If you still get heart, you still got a way out of no way. God says the strategy is in your heart. God says the implementation is in your heart. God says if you get your heart together, I shoot you forward. Certainly it is true what is from the heart reaches the heart. And you have reached into our hearts today. And we're reaching back. God, please give your sons and your daughters an impartation of their heart wrapped in your heart. That they will no longer be dissuaded. That they will no longer nurse the heartache but that they will stand by and experience it being healed. We thank you, God, that this is just the beginning. And that because of what you've done in this room today, in these hearts, I'm sorry, I just keep getting vision of what God's going to do because your heart is finally in the right place. I just keep getting anticipation. I think your faith is building my faith, and I'm just getting excited about what God's going to do. 
when our heart is in the right place. God, I thank you for marriages healed. God, I thank you for children being raised in health and wholeness. God, I thank you for restoration, for joy. I thank you for joy. Somebody's going to have joy again. I'm not just fighting and scrapping. I'm not just waiting on the battle. I'm going to give you your heart, and that heart's going to have joy in it. You're going to do it with joy. You're going to do it with confidence. You're going to do it with courage because you recognize that the battle was never yours. It was always the Lord's. All I needed to do was show up for the fight because the fight has been fixed. So y'all can fight all you want to, but I'm rejoicing because I know there's victory on the other side of this. And so, God, I ask that you would seal this word as only you can do. Let it take root and produce generational fruit. And may we birth a generation of people who do it from the heart because their hearts are connected to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I hear just the sound of praise? Can I hear a sound of victory? Can you do it from your heart? That's like one of those autopilot church praises, but just for a minute, can you allow your heart to receive what God did in this place? Can you allow your heart to rejoice because it's coming back to life? Can you allow your heart to receive that resurrecting power that allows it to beat again, that allows it to pursue again, that allows it to see again? Heartbreak is not the end. That devastation is not the end. Come on, you got to lift up the name. Come on, you got to lift up the name that was above every other name. Your heart has been hanging on to one name, but there is a greater name. There is a greater kingdom and I want to give your heart 10 seconds to soak it up 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 I gotta practice this thing